do is go through about six different potential roles of art in an environmental context. Obviously, this isn't an exhaustive list. It's, it's sort of impossible to do that. But what I'd like to do is sort of give a very general overview of some of the key strengths of art in environmental discourse. One of the most important things, and sort of one of the, the earliest, what I would call the earliest rules of art in environmental discourse, is the idea of appreciation. And what I mean by appreciation is creating a regard for nature. And so I'm not a contemporary artist, um, the landscape painters um, are well known for, for creating this regard for nature and this idea of nature as something beautiful and sublime and important. Um, this example is a painting by British painter um, John Constable. Um, it's a 19th century painting and it sort of epitomizes some of the very romantic and early ideas of nature, um, which are sort of reflected later in, in the ideas of Thoreau, uh, which comes a little bit later than this. Um, I wanted to mention also in showing this is that in, in recent years, uh, climatologists and environmental scientists have been using paintings such as these to actually study the climate. Um, John Constable is one artist that's been used, but also um, it's Monet. And environmental scientists are using these kinds of paintings to understand the cloud formations and the sort of history of past environments. sort of difficult to talk about uh, environmental art without making a mention to land art and, and earthworks. Um, this is an example from the 70s by artist Robert Smithson. Um, these works are actually sort of controversial in that a lot of the artists feel that it can create a regard and a respect for nature. Um, and other people <coughs> feel that it's quite destructive because what these artists do is actually use aspects of the landscape and it can be quite large, square, large scale and quite destructive. Um, having a background in geography, I think a lot about space and about what art can do to create a sort of awareness of space. And it can be in nature, but it can also be in public spaces particularly um, in an urban setting. Um, a lot of my research actually focuses on this area, and uh, I've been doing research in uh, street art and the geographies of street art, and also a phenomenon called yarn bombing, which I'll give <coughs> an example of. First, I'd just like to give an example of a very large public installation, just by a uh, well-known uh, public artists Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, they're quite well-known for these very grand, very dramatic sort of aesthetic pieces, um, which they claim to have um, not any deep meaning, but more to change how people perceive their environments. This is actually a Montreal example. This is a street artist called Rosworth. Um, Rosworth um, was quite a controversial graffiti artist for a short period of time because he started painting bicycle lanes where there weren't any as a sort of response to a lack of uh, public bike lanes but also as a sort of commentary on how much of the public urban space is taken up and devoted to cars. of um, yarn bombing, and this is uh, a sort of recent trend in street art where uh, textile artists introduce um, elements of wool and different textiles into urban settings. Um, usually it tends to be quite unattractive settings, such as, for example, of, um, crochet lace put into barbed wire on the top of a fence in New York. Um, you might have seen other examples even in Montreal where people have um, knit sections of wool around trees and posts and things like this.
Obviously, um, communication is another very um, important aspect that art can have in, uh, in with regard to environmental issues. Um, they can com communicate information and issues in a sort of more accessible way, a more um, almost democratic way, in a way that everyone can understand. This is an example of a performance artist based out of New York. Uh, what this artist did was give these brightly colored and actually scented garbage bags to businesses and residences and along a certain section of the street in, in New York for use on a specific day. And what his goal was was to sort of confront people with ideas of uh, overconsumption and the generation of waste. And what it did was, you know, piles of garbage is not such a, an unusual thing to see in an urban setting. But when you see piles of pink garbage bags, people have a very different approach to it. And I did an interview with Adrian for my uh, thesis, and he actually said that people would go up to these garbage bags and smell them and touch them, and it's not something that you would usually expect. Uh, this is another example of how um, environmental art can communicate um, in a very different way. This is the work of two Australian artists who are based out of Los Angeles. Um, actually, one sister is an artist and one is a scientist. And what they do is crochet these um, coral reefs based on hyperbolic mathematical models. So it's, it's a combination of art and science, but it's also a tool to communicate on the impacts of the coral reef disappearing as a result of climate change. And actually, the image on the right there is made out of uh, plastic waste, and they actually decided um, as a sort of awareness raising tool to stop throwing out their plastic for a year. And so they had a lot of waste, and they started to use it in their work. Um, this is an, a, another role that's becoming, I think, more important, especially as the impacts of climate change, especially, are becoming more easily uh, documentable, I guess, in the word. Um, it helps in visualizing issues that are sort of difficult and far removed for people to understand. This is uh, an example of photographer Susanna Saylor, and she works um, with a project called the Canary Project. And she traveled around the world documenting with photography some of these impacts of climate change. And this is an example of uh, melting of uh, permafrost and ice in the Antarctic. This is another sort of extremely powerful, disturbing, but also very beautiful image. This is the work of artist Chris Jordan. Um, it's part of a project he did called Midway Message from the Gyre. This is not a stage photograph. This is, as he found it, this is an albatross in the Pacific um, where there's a huge amount of plastic waste floating around the ocean. And these birds mistake these brightly colored objects uh, for food. And as you can see, there's a lighter and bits of colored plastic and obviously they die. And this is quite a big problem, and it's also interesting because it's such a far removed um, location, geographically far away from civilization, and yet the impacts are, are very real. Uh, this is an example of a Canadian artist. Um, he works on sort of very similar themes. Um, documenting the impact of industry on the natural environment. Um, this is an example of the tar sands in Alberta. And it's a very beautiful photograph, but it's also very frightening, uh, given the sort of devastating environmental impacts associated with this type of project. Um, what's interesting is that he's actually having an exhibit right now at the McCord, I believe. Um, I think this is what 
a very, very important aspect of art, and it's the idea of instigation or provoking, or also the idea of art as a catalyst for change. Um, I didn't want to give too many examples of this because I think that that all of the images I've shown could very easily fit into this category. Um, I'd just like to show an example from Greenpeace because Greenpeace has been very active in using art, um, and particularly performance art, as a way to instigate change, to provoke, to raise awareness. And this is an example of one of their polar bears. I think that this is, um, this is the last one that I'm going to discuss. Um, and when I started thinking about this, the idea of innovation, there's sort of like a techno technological association that, that you easily make with the term innovation. But I think it's more than just innovating new technologies, but also innovating ideas. And I think um, given the very strong art-science divide that is uh, particularly problematic when we talk about environment, the idea of giving a different perspective and that artists can bring something completely different, I think, is very important. Um, not only that, is that artists have a different approach to materials, to space, to things that maybe not necessarily seem important to environmentalists, but for example, I don't have an image of this here, but um, I did part of my master's degree in Sweden where they invented Tetra Packs. And, um, we talked about Tetra Packs all the time, about how they're such a wonderful technology and how they're so wonderful. They're light, they're, they're easily, um, they can easily be decomposed and recycled so the technology doesn't really exist. And then I met an artist who actually takes Tetra Packs and weaves them and uses them in her own installations. And it was just such a different approach to the material and to the technology. And I think it was something that obviously creators of Tetra Pak would never have considered. I just wanted to give as an example of this innovation. This is sort of a very typical uh, document that you would see, a diagram that you would see in a report, uh, for example, on climate change. Um, this is actually showing the high water line where sea level rise would affect um, New York uh, under different scenarios of climate change. Um, what artist Eve Mosher did was took this information and then actually walked this line. Okay. So she took, if you can see, sort of difficult to see, but she took this um, machine to draw a blue chalk line and walked this entire line in, in all of Manhattan. And what this does is sort of take scientific information and portray it in a way that people, especially people on the street that she interacted with, could understand in, in a far more accessible uh, way. So actually, um, I didn't want to talk too long today, and I wanted to finish with a very short video. Um, the video is actually um, from um, an artist, actually a writer and poet, a British um, poet called Len Cisse. He was actually um, one of the artists that was sent up in the Cape uh, Farewell Project. I don't know if you know it. It's where they take um, artists and scientists and bring them together and send them up into the Arctic to confront the, the impacts of climate change. So I will just show this video. And it's just three minutes. I have time He's uh, Leah Barthero. Yeah. Oh, she's here. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. Hi, Leah. Hi. 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 Great religions are promulgated through society by art. Christianity would be invisible without the Bible, likewise Islam and the Quran. Both are promoted by literature, by works of art. Art is a time traveller, 
Art is an omnipresent teller of story. It's more effective than CNN, the BBC, and Sky News put together. Art is in all the poems read at all the funerals and weddings that happened on every day of every year of your life from every class, race, gender, and sexuality of human being. The freedom to write is a sign of a free society. Art is the greatest symbol, the greatest expression of freedom. No wonder writers are a threat to repressive regimes. It's because of the greatness and importance of books. Art bridges the gap between the spiritual world and the physical one. At times of great need, trauma, loss, celebration, reunion, hope, introduction, we need the bridge. We need art. It's why there's song. It's why there's poetry. It's why there's dance. It's why there's music. What can art do? Art can save lives. People need the bridge over their troubled waters. Because art is life. This is not an exaggeration. Take away those poems, those songs, paintings, music, and leave citizens bereft of expression. Their madness lies. Art offers a quality of life and of experience, a fundamental power of art is to articulate. If aliens visited us, they get a truer representation of the human being through art and through anything else. Art is as close to the environment as human beings can get. What art can do is what it does. I have seen homeless men and women speak who have not spoken before due to some unspeakable trauma. I've seen poems bring the invisible into focus on national radio. I've seen crying children smile. I have seen poems change lives. It's why poems are read at weddings, funerals, births, on royal occasions and personal occasions, when soldiers are at war and in peacetime. We turn to art because it is the greatest expression of humanity available to all.